morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so this is my background here. So I was a cattle vet uh, in Finlay, southern New South Wales, for for some time. I uh, that's my father on the right hand side. He was uh, a, a vet there for 40 years. Um, me on the left, thereabouts 10 years ago. Um, I always joke we, we speak a bit about genetics. Well, I didn't inherit the bicep gene from my dad, so. I never cut my sleeves quite as short as he did. So I I was at uh, at Finley for it was it was there about eight or ten years, and I um, it was a family practice, and we sold it to APM Animal Health in uh, at the end of 2015, and I worked for them for another three years, and then I, I made the move to Zoetis, um, and a part of the reason I made the move was actually because of the strategy of the company. And if you were to, a lot of people, I imagine you would know Zoetis. Um, we've actually, Zoetis is, this is its 10th birthday since it was a divestment from Pfizer. Um, and it was, it's now purely a dedicated animal health company do, doing both companion animals and livestock. I think a lot of people would, would know the company more by the brands than they would necessarily the company. So by the, um, the vaccines, or the drenches, or the antibiotics, or the 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 um, genomics offering now. But if you to sort of summarise the company on one slide, it's this, and it's uh, it's both the way that the company um, uh, positions itself and invests, and also the way that the the company and and us dudes in the field are trying to deliver to farmers. And so there are really four pil pillars of the company, um, and the first one is around predictive technologies. And so as it pertains to the beef industry or the cattle industries, technologies that we can use to predict the future of animals or of cattle. And they're pretty neat. Genomics is cool because it gives us the ability to identify genes that we really want in our herd that are uh, looking to solve the issues of the future and the way that we want to breed. So um, things that are associated, genes are associated with production outcomes or fertility outcomes or gestation length or, cover, or, or health outcomes. Um, so that's our, the sort of first of our pillars. And once we've selected those animals, say they're our replacement females, the next thing we want to do is prevent common diseases. And so we've got a pretty big vaccine portfolio and that forms the bulk of our preventative health. Uh, the next thing is a growing area that I'm quite involved with, and it's point of care diagnostics. And so in the instance that our preventative healthcare measures fail, uh, then we wanna be able to pretty quickly, rapidly, easily, cheaply um, diagnose conditions, these common conditions, so that we can work out a decent treatment plan. And so, we're focusing on point of care diagnostics. So point of care equals crush side or bringing it to the clinic or bringing it, um, it to, a, to a place where in a pretty short time frame we can get answers about the diseases that we may be dealing with. And once we've found out what diseases we may be dealing with, we've still got an investment in our um, treatment portfolio. So they're things like antibiotics, drenches, and inflammatories, and we're also working on some new and novel treatment modalities. So it's a pretty, it's a fun company to work for. Um, there's, there's for every six of us in the field, there's one researcher. So there's a pretty big reinvestment into research and we get the great pleasure of, uh, of then launching these products into the field. So I'm gonna talk about a few things today. Um, the, the, um, I'm going to talk about the immune-ready guidelines and then just a couple of vaccines that we've, uh, that we've got in the market which I think are important to back up the guidelines. Oh, first, that's right, I had one more slide. And they're, they're, they're actually just these, if you actually look at the, um, the sort of growth stages of cattle, that's how we position our products. And so we've got things like early in their life, we're going to be using the genomics products, HD50K and Heifer Select, and then... We've, um, we've got our preventative uh, vaccines like Ultravax 71 for clostridial diseases and lepto and Bovitec to stop coccidiosis developing. And oh, we've got calf scour tests and 
point of care, well, in fact, it's an add-on to genomics, which is our pestivirus PI testing, and it goes on. So you're probably familiar with many of those brands. So um, one of the, I guess, the key things that we try and do is, a, as a company, to deliver on what we want, want to achieve. Uh, we've got to develop good relationships with both our, with our external stakeholders. Angus Australia is one of them, um, and some of the other um, key people that, that um, function within our ecosystem. And so the immune ready guidelines is something that we've been, uh, that, that Zoetis is supporting. Um, and I'll run you through what they are. It's a bit hard, there's normally like a screen there, so I'm trying to think of my next slide. Is this one. So what we're trying to achieve with the immune ready guidelines is we're trying to maximise productivity and minimise the transfer of disease through the supply chain. We're trying to provide producers with a mechanism that they can flag that their, their cattle have a point of difference based around their vaccination status prior to sale. One of the things that we often are asked about at, at producer events and field days is how do we communicate or how do we capture value in having a differentiated product, you know, based on the, the vaccination status or the health status. And the third thing is to improve farm biosecurity. So I guess the backdrop of why we believe this is important is if you have a look, who's seen these graphs? I'm always amazed at how much we transport cattle and sheep around Australia. So on the left, that's cattle and sheep movements into and out of sale yards on like the 29th of January, 2015. And so we move cattle, and that's the same thing. That's just one day major movement patterns. And so we're, we're moving cattle and sheep north, south, east, west, all over Australia every day of the year. And so you can imagine why this creates opportunities for the transfer of disease. The next thing, so this was a, a, just a producer survey that was done by MLA back in 2018 that would, would just ask him about quarantine and induction practices of, of farmers, of beef farmers. And so farmers reported, and these are the national averages, that just under half of people do any form of quarantining on farm. So they buy cattle, generally they just go straight out in the paddock. 30% um, of producers drench and dip. I, I reckon that's pretty concerning because we have widespread resistance now to our macrocytic lactones, ivermectin, doramectin, moxidectin, abamectin. So our, um, if you haven't already bred resistance on your own farm to our common parasites, if you're not quarantined drenching, there's every chance that you'd be bringing some in. 30% is too low. And finally, 16% of people vaccinate on arrival. And given like vaccines, one of our, like, it, it, it's core prevention of disease and our vaccination rates really are quite low in Australia. So I think we can, we can probably challenge that. And finally, the, the next bit of the, the puzzle, I think, was the creation of the National Cattle Health Deck. So I think this was done about circa 2016 when JBAS came out. And prior to that, we had, and we still have, national vendor decks. And vendor decks are about food security. They're about making sure that antibiotics, the drenches, and otherwise don't end up in food. They're not about communicating um, key parts of, of animal health information from one person to the next. And so that's what the National Cattle Health Declaration, similar one for sheep, aims to achieve, is to give people a mechanism to communicate this, the health plan that they've been on, call it an animal health passport, um, between members of the supply chain. But we're not really using it that much. And we can track it because of the, through integrity systems, we can track it and, and see how many people print off 
a vendor deck or a cattle health deck at the same time they do a vendor deck. It'll never be 100% because of the terminal trade, but it's probably realistic to think that it could be 50% or, or 60%. So I guess the, the core problem, I think, that we were trying to achieve uh, with the immune ready guidelines was, to, was that there's reasonably low levels of risk management deployed by most of us uh, when trading cattle. And that creates opportunities for the transfer of diseases between farms. So then if we go back to the solution, which was winding back to those initial aims, we're trying to maximise productivity and minimise the transfer of disease. We're trying to give producers a mechanism to differentiate cattle based on their vaccination and health status. And finally, to promote on-farm biosecurity. So to do that, um, it was something that we worked with with the Australian cattle vets and, and then more broadly with the major peak industry councils uh, something that, that we support along with the other two uh, vaccine manufacturers and suppliers here for cattle in Australia, which is Coopers and Ver Verbac. And what we're hoping is that for buyers, again, we're going to re reduce the risk of disease coming in with purchased cattle. We're going to improve farm biosecurity and we're going to improve animal health and welfare. And for sellers, we're going to be able to, we're, we're giving you a, a program um, to prepare cattle for potential disease challenges that they'll face into the future, which hopefully enables people to capture a premium at sale. We've seen this in the US. The US have had a program called SelectVac for 30 years in play, and they've been able to demonstrate just through market forces about a, a $50 to $80 a head premium for cattle that are pre-vaccinated going in, into feedlots. Um, and also, you get the upshot of safeguarding against these diseases on farm just by having a decent animal health care on vaccination plan in place. So really, simplicity is bliss with these types of programs. Um, this is going to be a, a, it's a three-step process. Vaccinate cattle according to the guidelines, um, then use the, the logos and the, the digital assets or re however you're going to be selling your cattle. Um, to promote your cattle is having that point of difference. And then the third thing is by using the Immune Ready Guidelines logo, you agree that you'll be providing cattle health declaration. Cattle health, I mean, they're a stat deck, legally binding document. Um, that, that is the declaration that you have administered the treatments as you have stated and as you've advertised. So the guidelines, how do we come up with them? So in Australia, there are 11 different diseases that we can vaccinate against when we pull the vaccines from the different animal health companies. Some of us are in the same space and some of them have, and, and some companies have um, vaccines in, um, in a single space. And they align with the terminology that's used on the cattle health deck. So you've got clostridial diseases, lepto, pestivirus, vibriosis, IBR, manheimia, list goes on across all the way to the end with bovine ephemeral fever and tick fever. We then thought, well, you've, you've really got to um, align this with the intention of use of the cattle. So it's a different disease profile that you're trying to prevent um, for breeding cattle versus terminal, the terminal trade. And so we segmented it into breeding bulls, into breeding females, and into uh, you know, the terminal trade, essentially, into feedlots. So steers, non-breeding females, and, and non-breeding bulls. We then came up with a, a traffic light style of system where we said, well, we've got core vaccines. The definition of a core vaccine is, um, or a core, you know, a disease is that it's endemic to Australia. So really that it's, it's quite, doesn't follow any certain production system or geographical constraints. It's from the southern end of Tasmania to the top end of the territory, east to west. Um, those those core diseases cause significant animal health and, and welfare problems, or they cause human health problems and, and risk of zoonoses. And finally, safe and effective vaccines exist for those diseases. So they're the, they're, they're the green ones. 
They can see Pestivirus here has some testing requirements around it, which I won't go into now, but um, essentially saying that, that uh, for, for breeding females, Pestivirus vaccine, or Pestiguard, is a core vaccine, but over and above there's some testing requirements like ear notching bulls or, or, or PI testing bulls, which is uh, necessary. We've then got a, uh, the next group. Uh, these diseases are important in certain production systems uh, or, or in certain areas. And so they didn't fit quite, they didn't really fit the bill for a core vaccine. Uh, an example might be, you know, say, say botulism, where up through the north of Australia, that's probably the first vaccination that, that many farmers would use. D down in the south for botulism, um, particularly on our grazing pastures in, in beef, there's not many people using uh, a botulism vaccine. The next group were the, the reds. You know, they don't stop, don't worry about it, doesn't impact that, uh, that class of stock. An example of that would be fibrosis in steers going into feedlots. Uh, they're not designed to breed, so therefore you wouldn't need to use a vaccine. And finally, we've got these, these diseases here that are or confined to, to, to geographies, bovine ephemeral fever and tick fever. And we've got those distribution maps here. That's the maximum distribution that we've seen of bovine ephemeral fever. It gets monitored every year um, through the National Arbovirus Monitoring Program. So you can see that it's got a fairly wide distribution but tends to be uh, in, in, into the north of Australia. Uh, we've got the cattle tick tr distribution, which is, a, which is a little bit higher than bovine ephemeral fever. So if we're moving cattle into those areas or if we're breeding cattle into, in those areas, we really got, should be thinking about uh, providing some protection against those diseases. So the next is, is just um, using the Immune Ready logos um, as, as a, it really is a market signal. It's actually quite, it, we, we don't really have that mechanism in Australia at the moment um, to provide that. It's like the quick check to look. Um, we're hoping that we can get it in our digital auction places uh, where we can see that there is, that cattle have been you know, on the program and that they have that point of difference. And those assets as they sit at the moment are on the website, immunready.net.au. And finally, um, we then provide a cattle health declaration to, to verify those treatments. So circling back to the, um, the points of difference, it's, it's again, it's just around maximising productivity and minimising disease risk, risk when trading cattle. We're trying to give you that point of differentiation based on the health status and improving farm biosecurity. And so that, they're the immune ready guidelines. And I hope that we can work um, and use these. In, in, in the US, I said it was 30 years ago. So we're not expecting that we're going to change everything overnight. But with persistence, I think that this can be something that's um, incorporated into our thought processes around how we um, procure cattle and buy cattle and sell cattle. And to finish, I wanted to give you a few examples of why I think this is important. Um, and these are just some anecdotes of what I've seen in my journeys as a cattle vet. And the first one was, uh, it's a bit of a funky photo, but here you go. So, this is a dairy calf, sort of. Um, and you can see it's got a pretty funky face. It uh, doesn't have a nose. It's got googly eyes and small ears and its tongue's hanging out the side of its face. So I saw this calf in, uh, in Finley and there was, a, there was a producer and he called me up and he said, Matt, I've got 30 embryos um, due to, well, recips, I mean, 30 recips due to calve. Um, the first two were born still, and the third one looks really odd. It looks like an alien. Can you come and have a look at it? And so I went out and had a look at it and thought, geez, this is not good. What, I said, what, what, what did you, this looks like a pestivirus calf. Looks like a, it's persistently infected with pestivirus. Something's gone wrong. And we've got one of those little neat little point of care diagnostics. Looks like a COVID test strip. Um, and so I ran a test, sure enough, it's persistently infected with pestivirus. And I said, what, what happened about six months ago? Thereabouts, because that's when pestivirus tends to do a lot of damage. And he said, well, what, what am I? I had the recips, they were out next to the dairy, 
Um, they, were, they were on a total mixed ration. Uh, it, was, it was quite, a, it was probably a, a pen not much bigger than this room. And I was just taking good care of them there. And one of my friends called me up and said, oh, I've got to take a, a, I'm taking one of my prized heifers to Dairy Week. Dairy Week's only about 130 k's. Well, Tatura's only 130 k's of Finley. I said, why don't, why don't you come and park her for a couple of weeks? And, um, and you can get her ready there. She'd be nice and close to the dairy. She'd be fed a total mixed ration and, uh, and all will be good. And so he did that, dropped the heifer in, picked the heifer up, took it to Dairy Week. Turns out that heifer herself was pesti persistently infected with pestivirus. And so he said, what, what's, what could be the worst case scenario here? I said, well, the worst case scenario is that every calf comes out looking like this or, or, or you know, or a still, stillborn or an alteration of this and we have to euthanize a whole lot. And I said, well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Unfortunately, it did. And so every calf came out looking like this or it had, they'd come out and they'd have pathological fractures or, you know, we'd have to we, we euthanize a whole lot. So it was really, really distressing to be involved in and distressing for the farmer of course. Now, this could have been largely prevented by doing some of the things, the, the key concepts of immune ready. Next one. Um, so th these two heifers are 16 months old, um, born three weeks apart. And it was a similar sort of thing. This is, this is in Victoria, um, where the, the neighbour of of this farmer was into calf roping and, and into the rodeo scene. And um, the, the, he was buying um, reasonably cheap calves out of the yards, because that's what you do when you're calf roping. And unfortunately, those calves were jumping the fence and jumping in with the pregnant cattle, heifers and, and cows. And um, as you can imagine, they were probably persistently infected with pestivirus, runty little calves. And it wasn't until about this point, it was about 12 months, you know, they were about 12 months old, thereabouts, and um, you notice some of them, not all of them, but some of them, uh, were, were sort of fading away and succumbing to something. And so we went out and had a look again, and sure enough, it's pestivirus. And they, again, oh, we, we went through and you them, and, and they, had, um, they had about you know, 16 or 20 of these. So, Again, a situation that had we've employed some bit more biosecurity, um, we probably could have pre prevented this and, and implemented a decent, decent vaccination program. This pro problem wouldn't have been anywhere near as big. So I guess, what, what did they have in common, these two farmers? So what we're looking at here is just a, a timeline of, of when, when cow, cows conceive to when they give birth 280 days later. And there's a window here where all the organs of the calf are developing. So their eyes and their ears and their liver and their lungs and sex organs and whatever. They don't have, they don't have an immune system at that point. Now, if there is an introduction somehow, like in these instances here where, where, the, where a persist, one of these persistently infected cows gets in and infects the cows that are pregnant in this window, that virus infects the cow or the heifer, crosses the placenta, takes up residence in that unborn calf. Then the immune system of the calf starts to develop and as it's developing, it's going around and going, well, you're the, you're the eyes, you're the, you're, the, you're the liver, you're the spleen, you're the whatever. You're all the organs and you're pestivirus. You were here first, therefore, I'm gonna to tolerate you. You're a part of the self. I'm not coming after you, I'm not mounting an immune response. So the virus has found this really nifty little loophole um, where it's able to evade detection from the immune system. And that is pestivirus's whole goal in life is to create more of these because then the circle of life goes on. It doesn't get it right every time. If, if the virus happens to land sometime out of that window, it can cause ovarian problems or early embryonic loss, whatever. We just see less pregnancies on farm. But the whole goal is to create PIs because that is how life goes on for pestivirus. So 
this is how this, this virus fundamentally is different to many viruses that, that we know. Most viruses that we know cause transient infections. And so, say I had COVID today, which hopefully I don't, I feel good. And I came and I sneezed on one of my good co-workers, Tommy Burks up the back. He's one of my comrades in, uh, in the vet team. Tom then, then sneezes on Lockie, who stood up here before. And then we all just get a dose. We manage to mount an immune response and get rid of it. We get crook, but uh, we get over it. That's just normal transient infection stuff. Now, that does cause an impact. I'll show you what sort of impact it does cause but it doesn't cause a persistent infection. So that persistent infection or a PI that we have colloquially come to call it is when those calves are in utero and they're exposed prior to them having a functional immune system and they remain infected for life. So one of the questions I think is, is how much can these transient infections actually do damage in our breeding herds? And this question was actually answered to a degree by Mike McGowan when he did a, published a study back in the 90s where he looked at cattle. So the, these are, this was prior to a vaccine. And so this is, this is just two groups of cattle. Um, and this is these, oh, they were heifers, Bos indicus heifers. And this is looking at whether, if they were immune prior to mating. So if they were immune prior to mating, they'd had PIs running with them, all right? Now, they, AI these heifers, and on the day of AI, they blood tested them and pulled out any PIs, right? And then they went back 70 days later and they pulled bloods again and preg tested them. And they looked at heifers that were immune prior to mating, sort of similar to being vaccinated, or those that were infected during the mating period. And that's their conception rates just off one round of AI. So 45% versus about 25%. So it caused a big problem, right? That's, that's what ovarian dysfunction looks like. You'd be pretty disappointed, I reckon, if you did an AI program and that was, that there was the result. And this was just an artificial infection study that was done by Pete Kirkland, but just, it was, it was again, just showing that, yep, genuinely, this is a problem because that's a normal fetus that's about six weeks old. And that there is a fetus that's been infected with pestivirus um, that's it's obviously on its way out. So these, again, transient infections, the ones where it's not a PI, it's when you bump into a PI. What else happens? It causes quite profound immune suppression. And how we see that show up in our beef herds is that we, we see the common diseases that we all um, get frustrated with happen more often with greater intensity. And so calf scour outbreaks, severe pink eye, uh, mastitis, and pneumonia have all been shown to be exacerbated or made worse by the presence of pestivirus. So I guess, what's the crux of it? I think we're here with a, a reasonable, um, there's a reasonable number of us here that are doing genomics testing. And I think the, uh, the way that, the way we're, we all try and I guess, we want to manage it. The end goal of most people's programs is to be PI-free and fully vaccinated. The beauty of implementing genomics, HD50K and Heifer Select, is that you can add on one of these PI tests to get rid of the disease pretty easily out of your farm for $9.90 a head, and then implement a full vaccination program on top of that because you do not want this virus coming in and doing some of those things that I just showed you. Righto. So that's, that is uh, all I had to say about pestivirus. And then the next one I just want to speak about, the last, the last uh, topic was just IBR. Um, it is a, so the, that's kind of pretty blurry, but obviously that's the snozzer of a cow. That looks like a little cold sore in its nose. That's the eye of a cow, again, pretty watery eye with a little cold sore looking thing right there. They're IBR infections. They're caused by a herpes virus. They are of key importance in the development of respiratory disease in cattle, pneumonia. Now they cause immune suppression and, and they have a carrier status. You know, herpes is for life. Um, once they get it, uh, they, they don't tend to get rid of it. The next period of stress they go through, they, the, the, the virus recrudesces and they have another episode of it. 
And again, this has pretty high prevalence in the Australian cattle herd. We, we estimate it to be about 80 to 90 per cent of, of herds will have this virus present at varying levels. Um, we know that because of, of, uh, there's a lot of countries that we export live to that will test for IBR titers. But breathe easy. So we've, um, of recent times, we've, we've uh, it was only um, midway through last year, we've put out a new vaccine. It's called Rhinogard. When I say it's new, if anyone's worked in a feedlot here, you may have used this vaccine. Um, it had historically come as a frozen liquid preparation and we would um, sell it in 250 dose slots. We'd have to transport it on dry ice in big boxes and it would arrive at the feedlots and have six weeks of shelf life, which wasn't great for many people in commercial operations, but in feedlots it found its home. So we've put out a new formulation and it's called Rhinogard freeze dried. It's just like every other vaccine transported um, in cold chain, last 24 months in the fridge. Comes in 10 and 50 dose packs. There's me admin administering it to my own Angus heifer. So it's a two mil, it's an intranasal vaccine, which we don't have many, any. In fact, intranasal vaccines in Australia for cattle. If you've ever been to the vet and had your dog vaccinated for kennel cough, they may have squirted something up its nose. But in cattle, this is the first of the first and only of the, uh, the intranasal vaccines. They're pretty neat intranasal vaccines um, because they stimulate rapid onset immunity. So within sort of two to four days off a single shot. And so, um, of which we have shown uh, in registration work that we did and subsequent work to it a few years ago where we had to um, uh, demonstrate it by doing some work in the lab um, sponging cattle's noses um, to find the presence of antibodies in their nose. So it's, it's, a, it's a neat um, neat vaccine. And really the crux of the difference of how these work is what we've come to understand about IBR infections is that they um, we really need a local immunity to protect against the disease. And so what we're able to show and when, when we developed and subsequently tested the vaccine was that when we squirt the vaccine up the cow's nose, we get a really rapid onset of immunity. Uh, we look for these things called IgAs. IgGs are antibodies that live in the blood. IgAs are those that live on mucosal surfaces. And so we're able to show that it um, upregulates IgAs in the respiratory tract and also um, gives systemic protection as well through the upregulation of IgG antibodies antibodies in the blood. So that's really all I wanted to say about that vaccine, but we're here for the next few days. There's a bit of swag of Zoetis folk here. So come and chat to us if any of these vaccines is of interest.